never seen TV like this. Head spins. Very good. Because this isn't TV. It's hell. It's party time. It's excellent. Time to rock and roll. Me up. You got Our parents are trapped in television. Me up. You got Where have you been? Stay tuned. That's entertainment. Rated PG. Starts Friday, August 14th at a theater near you. Hello, welcome to Almost Cult Classics, the podcast. My name is Joe Ramoni, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Ryan Lancello. Howdy, folks. For big episode 25. Oh, boy. We made it. Uh, yeah. And to celebrate that, we are talking about our most commonly requested film. It's the one I saw the most. Since the start of this podcast, people mm-hmm. have been, not only that, since the start of the Almost Cult Classics videos, people have been, stay tuned, stay tuned. Um, now, I didn't grow up with this. But I remember you said you kind of saw it like on cable every now and again. I kind of did. I would catch it from here and there, and uh, you know, it's it's that got that high concept thing. And you know, as a kid, you're like, "Well, this is kind of interesting." You're yeah, watching TV already. You know what I mean? But um, definitely. and you were a big John Ritter fan because of the Problem Child movies uh, oh, already. Hundred percent, absolutely. Uh, it's definitely an almost cult classic. Yeah, uh, I had never seen it. I had, it had never registered to me. I don't remember ever seeing it advertised or on display in a video store. It, really? Yeah. I, it, and you know what? This is, I think when we did Cabin Boy, I said this, like, had it been a movie I liked as a kid, I would have had a much different opinion of it today. Hmm. Uh, I enjoyed it. It's not perfect. <laughs> it's it's got not some, even close it's to got perfect. It's got some issues, uh, which I'll get to. I have a couple of the reviews that people were talking about. But I overall thought it was pretty fun, at least. It's got a great concept. Yeah. All the actors are totally game. Ritter, Pam Dauber as his wife, Jeffrey Jones as like Spike, like the guy in control of the whole TV, whatever. Eugene Levy has a fun part. Everyone's given it. Yeah. They're all, you know what I mean? No one's really, no one's bad in it necessarily. It's just, this is why I never want to do anything remotely family oriented on the show. Because it's a dark movie. Mm -hmm. It's sort of satirical, but it never goes far. And actually, I should say that it does go far a couple times. But then it pulls back and it's just kind of goofy. This movie is, for me, it it was ruined by the, like, the fact that the kids had to have their own, like, dreadful subplot. Or, like, they're trying to, like, figure out what's going on and save the parents. And, like, originally when it starts, they're like, hey, we're going away for the weekend to give you and mom a chance to reconnect or something because like that happened with the kids parents his friend's parents got divorced so he's thinking that maybe if they give him some alone time so i thought that'd be it i thought they would you know they would just show up at the end of the movie i hate the fact that they have to come back and like then they figure out what's going on it's the the weakest part of the movie the kid's like an electronic whiz and he's helping them it's asinine and not only that too it's just just a shit in the 90s where like there's the 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 older uh daughter the younger you know, son, yeah, siblings. It's, it's always that dynamic, too. And there's always this. Okay, pus brain. Or whatever. What, is, what was with pus in the 90s? It was always an insult. See, I, so I'm, an, I'm an only child, so I don't have any... I know you have siblings, but, like, for me... I do. Do you? I should call them. Oh, now. You don't have, like, a, a... You weren't called pus brain by an older sister, though, right? I was you, the oldest. Yeah. Yeah. So you were calling everyone else pus brain. Exactly. Okay. Well, yeah, it's... Uh, it ties also into a lot of movies we talked about previously. There's a lot of connections like even cast members um you know eugene levy we talked about in club paradise which was a patreon exclusive episode which patreon.com slash almost called classics can i it's quick digression here here? yeah so last uh time on patreon we did the dark backward it's written and directed by adam rifkin right Mm -hmm. so you know we put it out on twitter hey new patreon episode he retweets it and says you know do it as in sign up for this so (laughs) <laughs> sometimes you know you get a little action you might get a sign up or two okay. not only did we get zero patreon sign sign ups we're down like 15 i think we lost 15. but what, what did you expect would happen like people who follow adam rifkin would say like i said it's just you know hey that's kind of interesting five bucks fuck it i'll, I'll take a look we lost <laughs> i think that's hilarious but well, um, we we were pretty complimentary of that movie, so I don't I know. It was, I, it, awesome. it's, it's was it was an interesting. And this uh, time on Patreon, we're going to be doing Mom and Dad Save the World, which for, not going to be as complimentary. Well, for whatever reason, you were you decided we were going to do. What Dude, was your reasoning behind that? Easily the second most requested. Is it really these two? Okay. 
well and they have a weird oh they feel i thought for a minute they were like either written or directed by the same person because well, they that, feel very similar well that opening credits is like the a, opening credits yeah it's like identical yeah which i liked i did too on both of them and then what a letdown after that but... i thought the opening credits were yeah for stay tuned are pretty fun um it's kind of like I get what they're trying to do here. They're trying to homage like cable movies and cable TV. And Mm -hmm. I will say this when they're going through channel to channel and like changing. I I like that. They're at least like they really stuck to the theming, you know? Oh yeah. You know, it's so it's like, we talked about that before. I forget what movie we were like, it it was probably silent movie. We're like, they didn't, they went to, they wanted to parody a silent movie, but it didn't feel like a silent movie. No. And this, I like that all the worlds they go to feel very grounded in terms of what they're trying to parody. And we'll talk about him a bit more. I'll go through his filmography in a second here. But this was directed by Peter Himes. And uh, right around in 1984, when he directs the sequel to 2001, 2010, uh, he basically is the DP on all those movies. So I guy, noticed that, yeah. The guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. Like, he's pretty... He's one of, This is one of those guys where he's a very uh, adequate director. He gets the job done, you know what I mean? And he's, you could do, like, it's funny. If you go back to the last episode, we were talking about this. We're like, yeah, we're going to do Stay Tuned. I'm gonna, I, I said I'm going to watch a lot of John Ritter movies because I don't think this guy did much. It did the opposite. This guy's done a ton of You said stuff. that afterwards. You were like, oh, fuck. I looked up Peter Himes and I was like. <laughs> I didn't watch one Ritter movie. I watched a ton of Peter Himes movies, though. Is that how you say it? Himes? Himes. 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 Um, yeah, Himes. I, I, did, I did not watch a lot of his movies, um, mainly because it just kind of like crept up on me that we were recording so i watched the ones that you said definitely watch capricorn one which mm-hmm. i watched uh and i watched running scared because that's just a movie i have always seen like on streaming and never decide to watch it so i was like this is an excuse to finally watch it you used to see that box in the video store all the time constantly constantly there's another movie on here that i used to see constantly uh might have been mom and dad saved the world i don't know well it was definitely um made because of 48 hours i feel like they were trying to do those buddy cop like let's get two contrasting stars together because it's billy crystal and gregory hines and it's just dull well you hear let me let's get to yeah, that all right I, okay. so the first feature himes does in 1974 it's called busting and it's elliot gould and robert blake and they're both like vice cops trying to like you know get this crime I've seen guy. the poster it's awesome they're actually like coming through the poster one yeah, of those yeah, things yeah it's a pretty good movie it, a lot of it gets by on those two they have a fairly good chemistry together and the story is kind of interesting but it's not uh but it's it's for 1974 it's one of those interesting uh flicks where it's just a little it's odd uh he does a uh, some stupid romance our time i didn't watch it uh then he does peeper with michael caine you familiar with this at all? No, I'm not. I didn't watch it. It almost ruined his career, though, because it was such a huge flop. Uh, it it kind of really screwed him. After in, in between, he writes uh, Telephone mm-hmm. with Bronson, which I didn't. I, I should have checked out. I didn't get a chance to watch that because I was excited to watch Capricorn One. Uh, next movie he writes and directs in 1978. So I have to put on my con- my, my my true hat, my conspiracy hat now. So everyone. Not everyone, obviously, but a lot of people think Kubrick helped fake the moon landing, right? So in Capricorn 1, they are faking a Mars landing. And it's kind of a cool reason why they're doing it, from what I remember. I'm shocked that NASA allowed their name to be put on this movie. Dude, it's hilarious. There's a lot of instances (laughs) like that in the 70s. I think it's Black Sunday, where there's a, like, it's a terrorist attack or a sniper at the Super Bowl. They filmed it during a Super Bowl. Like, they were getting... Cra- like, the NFL's on everything. There was... Oh, no, fuck, maybe it's Goodyear. There's okay. a terrorist is going to blow up the Super Bowl with the Goodyear blimp. And wow. Like, it's on the poster. The Goodyear blimp. I'm on. sure, yeah. yeah. Fuck, I just... My, my, my brain always goes to, in planes, trains, and automobiles, when Steve Martin has the rental car experience, they had to make their own rental car company. No rental car wanted to be a part of that. It's understandable. Yeah, so, like... But that's... Come on, this is like conspiracy and there's murder involved and cover up and nasa's like ah, go ahead yeah no big deal yeah i guess maybe they just pin it like nasa was like thinking like well hell holbrook did it not nasa because it really true. was he was kind of the whole one pulling the strings what was it they fucked up something like something technically got fucked up right and they knew that they're like we're not going to be able to get it's the, a very tightly written script because everything is um accounted for like 
when you're hearing the concept of this, you're like, well, how could, but it's, it's all very well explained and laid out and the astronauts don't know what's going on. They're kind of pulled into it and their families are threatened. It's not the three astronauts got a James Brolin, Sam Waterston, who's like the wise, every line's a joke, like a wisecrack. And then you got the juice. I was, that was shocking to me that he's in this. OJ? I texted you yesterday when I was watching it. I was like, dude, the juice is in this. <laughs> Playing an astronaut. Playing an astronaut. Uh, yeah, and they all... His death seems like the worst. Water or whatever. Yeah. They, they eventually escape like the hangar they're being held in. Um, because they're... Basically, they're faking the Mars landing, but they still have to send the fucking shuttle up. And right. then, you know, the thing has to come back. Well, the thing burns up on re-entry. So now all the astronauts have... You know, they're dead. They can't all appear again. But they end up escaping where they're being held, and it's kind of where the movie falls apart a little bit, honestly. Yeah, I will say this. That last, like, 20 minutes are great with the helicopters and the plane stuff. Telly Savalas flying yeah. the plane. Oh, my Dude, God. Dude, that is some thrilling, thrilling plane footage. I was, like, stunned yeah. watching them. Like, this is fucking breathtaking. But it's plot-wise, it's dragging. Because they all, all three of the astronauts basically go off in different directions in the desert. And then, uh, you know, two die, and James Brolin survives or whatever you did get the great david helston as the uh who is he he's he's working Some for congressman the congressman yeah. or something and then um oh but oh, i didn't finish my conspiracy okay thing here. Go, i'm sorry so you have himes makes capricorn one where they're faking the mars landing then he ends up doing the sequel to 2001 yeah it's a weird connection don't you is think it though? I, th- I think it's a strange connection <laughs> Ever, I think I think no you're imagination, reading too much. you fucking people, <laughs> you Ramones. Um, I liked it though. I thought it was cool. Is James Karen plays the vice president, right? I love James. Karen. So I know here's here's what I thought was really fun. Um, James Karen in this, I think he's in one of the other movies I watched with. I could be wrong. Uh, and then Don Kalfa, who is in Stay Tuned. Briefly, I, like, I don't know what his character Don is. Don Kelfa to be. gets used a lot by Peter Himes. Yeah, I know. Because I watch that. all these movies, he's popping up constantly. And, and that's why I thought maybe Peter Himes had something to do with Return of the Living Dead, because they're both in that. And it's wonderful. James Karen's so good in yeah. Return. Uh, just freaking out. Yeah. <laughs> he's like crying. He's like really good in that movie. So that's why I was like, maybe, I guess just a lot of these character actors, you know appeared in a lot of similar projects around this time but it's it's great to see them well that's what's cool it's like you know you always talk about character actors but for lack of a better term it's like himes is a bit of a character director you know what i mean he's not he's not he's it. not a spielberg yeah uh he's not a total schlockmeister or anything he's like in that weird middle ground where he gets the job done and like i said his movies are all across the board here because after capricorn one he follows it up with a movie you said you'd watch but you didn't and i didn't either because it was a World War II romance, and I'm like, I'm not doing it. Hanover Street with yeah, Harrison I, Ford. Yeah, I think that is like Harrison's first post Star Wars, like, um, and it tanked. From what I read, Harrison Ford was like, I don't. He's like, I don't, I'm never gonna watch that fucking movie. <laughs> I hated making that fucking movie. I don't want to talk about it. Leave me alone. So you didn't watch Hanover Street? I did not. But that's a notorious bomb. So after Hanover Street. Uh, is he writes a movie called The Hunter with Steve McQueen that I skipped because I, I kind of generally when I do go through directors filmographies I want to see what they directed yeah you know if they're just kind of writing shit on the side so after that play the hits right uh, there's Outland in 1981 and based on the strength of this especially how it looks he got 2010 mm. it's a cool movie Outland it's high noon in space that's what I've heard yeah and like when it becomes high noon in space it's like almost it's kind of a rip off quite frankly. It's just totally... But at least they're going for it in a different setting. I yeah, like, and you know, it's this... really cool. Like, like think about, like, uh, you know, like Blade Runner, when, like, you see the city mm-hmm. initially, and, you know, it's a model, but it's so, like, it's amazing. Outland's got a ton of that, because they're mining titanium. I think it's on Io, uh, a moon of Jupiter, which, funny enough, plays a huge role in the next one, 2010. Yeah. But, you know, it's, like, it's grimy. You know, they do those great exterior shots where it's just it's kind of dark on a fucking moon of Jupiter, and there's these enormous mining complexes. Really, it's really... like matte painting stuff. And yeah, it's mm. a great-looking movie. You got... Sean Connery's very good, and should we do an autopsy on for Like, Yeah, it's, it's awesome. He's very good. The poster alone is awesome. Him with, like, a shotgun, he's just kind of... Yeah, it's, it's a great. Good, it's a good movie. I actually really... And then uh, Peter Boyle, who's... Uh, the always, the always entertaining. And he plays, like, a good villain in the sense, like... You know, it's the future. They're mining titanium on a moon of Jupiter... 
but it's like business as usual almost. Like he's just got a polo and like a shitty hat. He's like, I'm just trying to get things done here, Mr. I like Connery. That. Yeah, it's it's good. I I really would recommend Outland. I I liked it a lot. Um, after that, Star Chamber. And this is one I wanted to watch. I just didn't have time. Dude, it's great up until a certain point. Mm. Like the movie begins, like Michael Douglas is this judge in California, and he keeps getting cases where the guys are fucking guilty, and like classic Philadelphia lawyer styling. Like, they get off on little technicalities, and he's losing his shit. He's like, I can't keep doing this. So once again, Hal Holbrook comes to him, and he's above him. He's on, like, the California Supreme Court, okay. the state Supreme Court, and he goes, look, uh, we just lost one of our guys. That's my Hal Holbrook, I guess. <laughs> and uh, he's like, well, we're going to bring you in to the Supreme Court. Apparently, the California State Supreme Court in this movie has a secret chamber, or, you know, they call it that. They all meet and, like, re-adjudicate old cases okay and they're like like uh, people got off oh, on them. i got they you. go what do we think were they guilty or innocent in reality and you know pretty much guilty. yeah, yeah. they have some hitman through 60 degrees of separation they hire and he goes out and kills these that people. sounds awesome it's pretty fucking who plays the hitman some random okay they, it's actually good they keep it pretty and look at the cast now because i see don kalfa is in this one and dude he's he could not play a scummier <laughs> He's great at that. He's really good in the Star Chamber. Like, this was a cool movie that bungles it at the and, end. And um, the great Larry Hankin, uh, he's, what's we call it, fake Kramer, you know, in Seinfeld. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. in a couple of these movies. <laughs> yeah. I noticed him in he Running is. Scared. Uh-huh. And I'm going to oh. point out another character actor who's also in this, and he pops up in Stay Tuned, uh, James Sicking. Uh, who plays in Stay Tuned. He's just one of the TV characters. But he, it says in this he's Dr. Harold Lewin. I love this fucking guy. Himes uses him a lot. But he is in Stay Tuned, right? Briefly? I no? I don't recall okay. him, no. Again, that's the thing. You watch all these movies and you're like, you start to see these character actors and you're like, oh, well, that's... that's. It starts um, to blend for sure. But I, the reason I wanted to highlight that was because he plays the old man in Ali Hopnell's Haven of Bliss, which is one of the TV movie sequels to A Christmas Story. Well... A movie based on the writing of Gene Shepard, and he's so much fun as Mr. Parker, you know, the Darren McGavin character. He's really, really great in that role. But he's, I've, he's, I've always appreciated him when I see him in things. What's his name again? James Sicking. Dude, he's awesome. Sicking? I don't he's know. He's really good in the Star Chamber because he's basically the, um, what's his name, the Don Kelfa character and his little, like, buddy. Mm -hmm. They uh, get accused of killing a kid, and Sicken's the father. And, like, he tries to, like, kill him in the courtroom and stuff. Like, it's excellent. It's a really good role. Not, what, what did, you said the movie falls apart or something, though? It it's... does because it gets to the point where, like, Michael Douglas is like, wait, I don't want to do this anymore. And then, like, the way it ends, it has a, like, atrocious ending. That's, like, all, that's always sucks when it's... Where it's too... It's not that it's open-ended. Like, it ends with, like, uh, Michael Douglas at some cop character he's befriended, like, eavesdropping on the Star Chamber. Okay. Like, recording them secretly. Like, they're going to expose them. And then it just ends. Like, it ends with them in the car listening to them. It's not a good ending, but it's a great premise. I'm and still going to check it out, I think. You should. It's a pretty good movie. I, I actually really like I, I liked a lot of it. Um, after that, he follows it up with 2010, the year we make contact, 1984. So I'm not a fan of 2001. I think it's a, a, a great movie to watch, like, visually. I just think it's, you know, I'm going to, not that I'm narrow-minded. I just think it is a little boring. I know that's kind of. The, how it, the structure of it? I've under I understand, but the it's criticism. visually great. It's it's a lot of. I I rewatched it to before I wanted to watch 2010. I think it's tremendous. Mm -hmm. It's like a sensual movie. Like you gotta understand, you're not when you get into that movie. If you understand what you're getting into, it's like laying in warm water almost. Like it, there's something about it. It's very uh, sumptuous. It like, is a commitment to kind of get through it that's one of those movies i tried to watch so many times like sure i think blade runner did that with it was like i i, tr I started it like 20 minutes just lost interest and like blade runner is so dour yeah too. It's, it's really a dour film i mean so is 2001 though there's there's uh, disagree oh really Dis 2001 is is it has this thing where i think people because hell loses it at the end mm -hmm. it's at the end that's kind of what everyone remembers about it but everything it's, up to that it's is such a minimal really, part of the movie it builds to that especially when he goes into like the stargate or whatever i mean it's fucking it's, it's, uh, come on there's uh, enough has been said about it i'm not going to add anything new to it i love 2001 now going into 2010 it's like why you know you think like that movie did it it did it all like it hit to me at least and i think a lot of people it hit 
everything it needed to be well, hit. Well, because, I mean, there is the book, right? That's There's a 2010 book. Uh, yeah. Like, Arthur C. Clarke did write all these books, so there is a continuation of the story. It's just the fact that the way 2001 was presented with its mystery mm. and its its somewhat open-endedness to come out after the fact and be like, we're going to answer all those questions. Well, he also, Arthur Clarke wrote 2010 after 2001 was made into a film. Right. So, Well, he also did it concurrently. Like okay. 2001, he wrote that as they were making the movie. Gotcha. Okay. It wasn't like based on a book necessarily. Mm-hmm. Now, this one, I think, was just based on a book. Uh, that said... It sounds very similar to like, what's going on with Crichton with Jurassic park where like the book was almost finished and they started filming the movie mm. and then he only wrote wrote the lost world because they wanted to make a sequel to the movie so there's a lot of that happens with books of movies that become you know huge hits i didn't know that about jurassic park mm-hmm. uh with that said like like that's the thing with 2001 you don't need those mysteries solved it's the point yeah but 2010 solves them even with that it's pretty good if you take it as a space movie it's actually pretty fucking it's got a great cast Got a very good cast. There's a scene with John Lithgow where they have to go from, like, they're going out to figure out what happened to the Discovery, the initial ship. Right. So they find it. And they have to go from their ship to that ship. And it's a f- tense, suspenseful, well-shot, awesome, like, pulse-pounding scene. It's really, really Hi, good. Hyams is also a cinematographer on yes, this, I believe. Yes, yeah. This is where he seems to start. Actually, this I think this is the first. And then he does it, like, basically for every film after this, I think. I think he does do it for every film, actually. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing here. But 2010's good on its own. Mm-hmm. Right. As a sequel to 2001, it sucks. Yeah. Like, it's annoying. But I might actually enjoy it, though. I mean, I think it's a briefer runtime. Bowman comes back, and it's, oh, okay. it's cheesy and cringy. It's all stars in there. Wow. It's like, it's it's that, like, what year is this? Uh, 82. 84. 84. You're starting to get that, like. For lack of a better term, like, I mean, not like starting. It was there, like, new agey shit. Like, mm-hmm. It's just, it, it, it's just kind of, I don't know. There's a, some goofy, cringy stuff in this, but otherwise, as a space film, like a space adventure, it's fucking awesome. I actually really liked it. I was surprised. Roy Scheider's fine. Um, Helen Mirren doesn't get much to do. You don't speak with a Russian accent, but it's good. Mm-hmm. I was, I was honest. I thought it was like, this movie's going to suck ass. Gets a little silly, like, what happens i think it might have even made the, a good one for this show at some point like as a it, it, it come, it's the mold of it i'd come back to it yeah the monoliths start multiplying oh, and like no. they eat jupiter it's oh, it's, man. it's weird it gets a little weird uh <laughs> but after 2010 1986 he follows it up with running scared which we were briefly talking about Ooh. earlier what a piece of garbage yeah. how do you make a movie about like a cocaine dealer and the cops going after him dull Dude, it sucked. And like, I was excited at first as I'm like, oh, cool. The one thing about these older movies is, oh, Chicago in the winter. Mm -hmm. Great, great photography. Yeah. Looks cool. I'm like, Chicago's a cool town. It's like in the winter, too. It's like, oh, this is cool. Like, yeah. These two have so fucking little chemistry together. Oh, my God. It's terrible. Crystal and Hines. They're like, everything looks like a first take with those two. Like, if you notice, if like when Billy Crystal's crack and wise. Like, Gregory Hines is trying to, like, you know, all roll his eyes and stuff. They're not on the same page acting-wise. Like, they're they're acting on different things almost. Yeah. It's really fucking bad. Oh, yeah. Well, and I even, like, I was reading a little bit about it. Like, I think they wanted to cast, like, an older kind of over-the-hill actors in it. Like, it wasn't supposed to be two young guys. It's, like, supposed to be two, like, kind of veteran cops that are sick of everything. And, and they are kind of like vets. Kind of like a comedy version of Dragged Across Concrete, where Dude, it's like, you know, they're like fed up with the system. And I, just, I seriously thought the movie was going to be about the two of them just opening up a bar. And it would have been preferable. It, when they end up in uh, Key West, is that where they end up? Or Bahamas? Where the fuck they it's go? Key West, I think. Uh, it, it's like the movie, it's so strangely paced. Because you're like, there's like a montage of them on the beach. And like, then we're back in Chicago. It's like, wait, I, it's. I don't. They're there for a while, too. Yeah. Like, it, fuck, fuck being a cop in Chicago. We're going to open a bar. And then, like, they keep getting fired or, like, taken off the case. It's very strange. Was Is this the one where... Because I, I, I didn't... My notes aren't super uh, filled out this time around. Was Dan Hedaya the chief? Yes. Wasted. Yeah. How do you waste Dan yes. Hedaya as an angry chief? I do. I did enjoy uh, Joey Pants as the... Uh, He's always What is he good. called? Snake? Something He's got, like, like a that, cockatoo yeah. hairdo. And then uh, you got Jimmy Smith's in there. It's Jimmy like, Smith's is fun. Yeah. Is that... The drug dealer, the main... Uh, it's, it was so weird for me how this movie didn't come together, like, at all. 
at all. I know it's weird too. You're talking about um, Chicago, the platform where you know they're they're driving like their taxi car ends up like on the L platform. That's the same L platform at the end of plane transit automobiles. Really? And I was just there because I did a little location video. So yeah, you didn't invite me. You gave me the idea though, so credit where credit is due. <laughs> but yes, it's it's so cool to see. Actually, you may no, you didn't invite me. You invited me to Pittsburgh. I probably for, did. Hey, I always I always reach I out know, and say. I know. Um, We're breaking up, folks. I know. <laughs> hey, you didn't want to go to the Buster Keaton convention in uh, Muskegon, Michigan, with uh, me? That's on you. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, this movie, not good. Fuck it. I, I can't get. I, I, it sucked. Yeah, it really stunk. And then uh. Well, well he, real, real quick, uh, I do want to say he does executive produce in 87, The Monster Squad, mm-hmm. which is a great, fun Halloween movie, uh, Shane Black. My one buddy, uh, shout out Michael Felton, is always trying to get me to watch that movie. Oh, you would hate it. Yeah, there's kids in it. Yeah. I'm like, no, dude, I don't want to watch do, it. They, they go, do it. let's watch Twister. I'm like, no. <laughs> they do at least behave and talk and curse like real kids, so Fine. that's kind of fun. Whatever. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> After Running Scared... Uh, this is his worst stretch, these two <laughs> movies. He follows up in 88 with the Presidio. Uh, he reteams with Sean Connery, who's like a uh, colonel, I think. I think it's a naval base. It just looks like one of these movies that just happened in the nine, or the late 80s that like were just filler. You know, that's another thing. It, it, it feels like that. Uh, but there's, you know, we, we were really, movies are so bad right now that we're really getting those rose-colored glasses. Like, oh my God, these movies were so good in the past. And sure, in a way, I think it's, I think a lot of that has to go with everything. Everyone was more technically proficient back then, in my opinion. I think that's one of the big problems today is that people aren't very good at lighting. Mm. They're not very good at editing. Uh, like, the technical stuff. I, I Sure. I, I don't think the skill is there. However... Dude, these fucking nineties, eighties movies, are, their their pacing is horrid, and their plotting is just absolutely incoherent at a lot of times. These are like movies that they would like you would just see on TNT, like that you're like have no memory of that you just like s- skipping channels and would say, be like this looks boring. The Presidio starts off great too. There's a murder at a base, mm-hmm. and the MPs are trying to, like... It's like a great chase scene through San Francisco. Like, they're trying to get the killer, blah, 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 blah. And then it just turns into this fucking... Like, Mark Harmon plays this, like, San Francisco detective who used to be an MP, so he knows Sean Connery, right? And he's just this pissy, like, bratty, like, guy. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck if he solves anything. Like, this guy stinks. Then he meets Meg Ryan, plays Connery's daughter... Okay. She tanks the movie. Because it's just like all of a sudden they have this romantic back and forth. And I'm like, oh, I can we that. solve the fucking murder? That's like when, you know, you have kids try to like be a part of the plot. It's like when they force in like the romantic subplot or the I it, it kills the it movie. D- it destroyed the film. Yeah. And uh, wastes our buddy, uh, Jack Warden, wastes him entirely. The scenes with him and Connery are good because it's two old salts. Like, oh, yeah, you know, fucking, bro. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, those are good, but otherwise the movie's a drag. It totally stinks. By the end, I didn't care. Like, oh, here's the thing. This is what's happening. Great. Who gives a fuck? I, I don't give a shit. Uh, after that, he follows it up with a pretty good movie, Narrow Margin, with Gene Hackman. Hackman, always good. Hackman, always good. And uh, this was a remake, apparently. Kind of like a middling 50s movie, apparently. But uh, what I liked about Narrow Margin is it's it's basically Gene Hackman's protecting a witness to, uh, like a, I think it was a murder. I remember I watched this a while ago. It was the Amish boy that put this to murder. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, but it's he has to take her from like the wilderness of Canada on a train to like an airport somewhere. It's just a train movie. I just look at these casts and I'm like, again, you have James Sicking. Who's, by the way. He's a hitman in this. He's so good at it, dude. He's like, fucking awesome. I realize it. what it is and stay tuned. He On the TV, you see Doogie Howser. And he is, so he technically is in Stay Tuned, but that might just be his buddy Peter giving him like a nod. It is. He's on, um, he's on the TV. And then I see M. Emmett Walsh. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta at, love. He's, he's good in it. Dude, Naira Martin. Harris Yulin. Yeah. I 100% recommend this movie. I might check this one out. Well, because it's like I said, it's just a train. They're mm-hmm. on a train the whole yeah. time. So it's like, oh, we got to get to here. We're being tracked. It's cool. I see that neo-noir action crime thriller. Nar- I'm like, I'm in. Naira Margin. I will check it out. Definitely uh, recommend that. Up next is Stay Tuned. So I'll skip that for a second. In 94, he does Time Cop. I never really got into Van Damme. I didn't either. Because like I said, uh, I think I said this last episode, action movies were like really done when I was like, growing up in the 90s. Like They just were 
so over done like it was just over and uh i never got into van damme but time cop was kind of fun man i liked it you know what you're getting into when you you do but it has that incoherence i was talking about where to go back in time they get into like this little jet capsule Mm -hmm. and it like shoots them down a track yeah almost like almost like back to the future like you gotta hit escape velocity or something then it they find themselves back in time but they just kind of like terminator time warp and they fall out of it so it's like well, where was the capsule then to get back to the present they just kind of press a button on like okay. the device why do you need that capsule yeah. thing and they keep coming back to like we got to get in there like hurry up we got to you know launch you it, it is i believe the highest grossing film of van damme's career probably yeah i like that it. it's goofy it's fun sam raimi produced it you know what i mean it's one of those i enjoyed it uh for what it was he followed that up with another Van Damme movie, Sudden Death. I didn't watch that. I've heard it's all right. I feel like there was one scene that used to get played a lot. It was because uh, it happens at a Penguins game, Pittsburgh Penguins. And I feel like the mascot gets like caught in a, really? in a conveyor belt or something. And like the penguin gets like eviscerated. Kind you always of... have these scenes like in these action movies where like there's a big event happening, a sports event or like something at a mall. There's always like a set piece where it's crowded and there's a lot of people around and well, it's funny you bring that up because the next movie does is The Relic from 97, which I never watched. I finally did. Uh, it's got Tom Sizemore. One, and you're one of your favorite actresses of all time. I love Tom Sizemore, but I can't stay. <laughs> We've talked about her before. <laughs> well, she ruins Carlito's way for yeah. me. I really have no problem with the woman. Uh, Penelope Ann Miller, right? Mm-hmm. She's fine. She's good. But man, she ta- she ruins Carlito's way for me. A movie I love. And her scenes just drag it down. Charlie, don't. Don't sell drugs, Charlie. We, I think when we talked about the artist, uh, I I, oh, I, right, I praised her in that, and you were just yeah, like, took a bit well, of shit on let's her. talk about Carlito's way a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> After the relic, uh, he does End of Days with Arnold. Oh, the relic's all right, by the way. It's like yeah. what you were saying. It's got that. It has a really couple good sequences where they're. It's like a big gala at the mm-hmm. at a museum, but this monster's loose. And, like the mayor and all like the rich benefactors yeah. are getting terrorized. It's pretty good. He really does get pigeonholed uh Hyams into doing like these tentpole action movies which is a shame because like you said there's a lot of really great thrillers and interesting films early in his career and then he does you know what is it I guess Time Cop marks a shift in his career uh, I think it's 2010 marks the shift okay even honestly stay tuned he kind of like really like, narrow margins awesome and then stay tuned is not and then after that it's just like mm. there's a couple cool visuals in stay tuned it's not the worst movie. Oh, wait. Can we, can we talk about that real quick? This kind of relates to 2010. Sure. Um, kind of relates to Kubrick, at least. Like, Dr. Strangelove appears in Stay Tuned. There's some good visuals in Stay Tuned. But it, Dr. Strangelove is in the movie. Mm. A character, like, just in the background. It's a, it's, it's a nod it's, to it's it. It's very strange. Because you do think, you're like, oh, what's this new character? Yeah. And, and then, then just nothing the happens. Kind of camera. Pan- yeah. It follows the wheelchair a little bit and then just pans away from him. And, and So that's not your brain going? Well, he's, he's telling us signs here. Uh, he, he wants I'm to go to. I'm just saying the... it's interesting that the man who made a film about you're like Elliot Gould in Capricorn One, where you're just like, <laughs> I am. What does that mean? I'm and... gonna I'm gonna drive home later. My <laughs> my fucking brakes aren't gonna work. <laughs> By the way, uh, I I shot this out on Twitter because I thought it was funny. I signed up for Trump's thing, Truth Social. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize Vivian Kubrick's on there. Is that his Ku- widow? Kubrick's daughter. Oh, daughter. So I followed her. She she don't really. I guess you don't tweet. She don't truth too much. <laughs> what do you expect? She's just gone drop all the secrets about the moon She has. She got banned from Twitter for saying all sorts of weird shit. So, Viv Kubrick, shout out. Follow me on Truth, uh, Vivian. <laughs> truth Social. Uh, so yeah, he, hasn't, he hasn't directed a movie since 2013. Well, after The Relic, yeah, he hasn't. But did you see End of Days? He did that one. A long time ago. Oral. It was okay. Yeah, it's like one of those, again, TNT movies I might have caught in the... 90s never being all right yeah uh after that does the musketeer which i didn't see but in 2005 he does one of the fucking worst movies i've ever seen and it's entertainingly bad like it's fun to watch it's a sound of thunder Mm -hmm. adaptation of the bradbury story it's it's got eddie brooklyn burns boy uh ben kingsley it's i mean like bafflingly bad i i really highly recommend that we this might be like a patreon episode it's Unfathomably bad, dude. Yeah, so, I mean, that's where I stopped with just... Yeah, well, usually we don't go beyond the movie we're talking about, but I know you had a couple... Well, just such it's such a diverse... Yeah. The movies are all over the place, mm-hmm. and I just, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I meant to check out... He did an episode of Amazing Stories, too, which I meant to check out again. I just didn't have time, but... Let's see that. 
Yeah, it's it's so weird. Like reading through this filmography, it's like all these movies start to sound a little bit of like like narrow margin, beyond a reasonable doubt, enemies closer. Like they all have su- like very similar. I almost watched Beyond a Reasonable Doubt, but then I watched the trailer and I'm like, this looks like it was mm-hmm. made for thirteen dollars. I'm not watching this movie. Well, I guess he enjoys working with Van Damme because his last movie so far, Enemies Closer, was 2013. That's one of his movies. And, uh, I mean, he's 79. He might still be doing stuff. But, yeah, it's it's interesting because I think when we originally, like you said, we're like, let's just do Stay Tuned because we've been requested it. Uh, I don't think we expected it would be so, you know, Peter Hyams' I, 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 career would be so diverse. came and out of so, nowhere for me. Um, which I guess makes Stay Tuned somewhat of a disappointment when you compare it against some of these movies. Again, I'm, I wouldn't do it with very high expectations because it's been suggested so many times. And I didn't, I didn't dislike it. Like I said, the only thing I think that really drags the movie down is those scenes with the kids. It's awful. Yeah. Uh, I thought John Ritter, uh, you know, we talked about it with Problem Child, but I think he's carrying the movie here. Oh, I, I think he's so fun. I think in all of these segments, because at a certain point, Pam Dauber disappears from the movie. A little uh, bit. And I know she was pregnant at the time, so I don't know if that Apparently was... Apparently the entire filming. I didn't yeah. realize that. Uh, she kind of just like gets sidetracked and we're following uh, Ritter's character, Roy, as he's kind of going through these, and I thought that was the best part of the movie. Once it starts to pick up, yes. and he's going through like one after another, because there's some where they spend a little bit too much time in these worlds. Uh, the French miniseries one is is really really long. Well, that's the problem with a movie like this, is, and I think that's why everyone, excuse me, has a fond memory of as a child. Because as a kid, it is very it's high concept enough for a kid, in the sense that you know you're obviously switching through all the channels, but the whole point is. Where are they going to go next? And they almost don't do enough switching through, I would agree. through milieus. I would agree. Because they spend too much time in certain ones. A lot, But yeah. the, um, the animated one I thought was a lot of fun. Chuck Jones, The right? Chuck Jones style animation and um, even the game show. Like they're, when they spend like a, a certain amount of time, the Saturday Night Dead, it's kind of funny. There's also like, because I'll read you one of the reviews I pulled. Like Saturday Night Dead took me a second, by the way. I'm like, I don't get the joke here. Uh, here, I have to say this. That they're not, all dead. I, I, it's not to cut you off. I'm going to put on my finger. That's my a finger, t-shirt. My finger is literally in his mouth. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 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 not why the mics are rolling. Anywho, uh, mics are rolling. Is that even a term? There's no tape spinning, so no. Yeah. Um, dude, the fucking jokes in this movie. I know it's a family type thing. There's, there, there. Well, there's, it's one note. It's... It's devil and death. Six, and six, six. Yeah. Devil. But it took me a second. I'm like, Saturday Night Dead. I'm like, D- what? And I'm like, oh, live. Live, dead, dead. Then they're all dead in the audience. Jesus and... Christ. So this is a review from the time, Variety, uh, Joseph McBride. Not diabolical enough for true black comedy, too scary and violent for kids, lured by its PG rating and witless in its send up of obsessive TV viewing. Stay tuned as a picture with nothing for everybody. Um, and he does go on, and this is something I noticed, but he says the premise has some potential because it's kind of like SCTV. Hmm. Yeah. I got that entirely without the cleverness. Like, it's just like... I I, dis- I, I would basically agree with that, except for I don't think it's... I think it could be darker for kids. It's not that bad. That's not that bad at all. It really isn't. It's a little... I, like you said, I think it goes... First of all, I thought the biggest laugh in the movie from me comes from driving over Miss Daisy because it's like one of the worst. Oh, you didn't like that? Well, it's just I'm like, just, why is there a billboard there? Because they, it's Can't I know you it's just put lazy the fucking filmmaking. title. I get on, it. And then like not only that, like he keeps looking at it, Ritter, like who? Huh? Like did you get uh, it? I just love when they just because Jeffrey, Jeffrey Jones is backing up. Over Jeffrey this. Jones just runs over this old woman. It's there's. Should we again, start with the initial? Of course. Okay. By the way. uh... It's funny. We're back in demon world. We got demons again. Last week with frailty. Last week. <laughs> Last year with frailty. <laughs> 2017. But we're still with demons. But, uh, yeah. So, good. Um, movie kind of, there's like an opening narration from the kid, which feels added in, in like yeah. post. I don't think that was That's part of it. It's really bad. But he, he part... compares John Ritter's character to Bill Cosby. Did you pick up on that? Yeah, that was He's funny. like, my dad's a lot like Bill Cosby. He, he says other TV dads, but yeah, it's always yeah. funny and, you know. Um, so yeah, he plays Roy Nabel. Uh, there's also the prequel with the uh, the elderly neighbors that have also been sucked in, mm-hmm. which we come back to them later. The saddle bombs. The saddle bombs. And, uh... Which, I, this is another thing that annoys me. You have this... You, there's so little said in that scene 
with the Seidel bombs, Murray and his shitty Herod and wife. But if you notice, I, who's that actor playing Murray Seidel bomb? He's really good. Yeah, he's uh, Bob Dishy. He's fantastic. Yeah, but she's like, get the popcorn, get this. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you can tell, he's like just totally checked out, like kind of like henpecked husband, like. It's a great little setup. Mm-hmm. And then they get sucked in. Yeah. And then, you know, we move on to the navels. But I'm like, this is the problem when you have a movie that's jumping from things. It's hard to get your feet planted. Yeah. And it's like, it needed a little more I of think that. that's why they, like, tried to shoehorn in the kids watching TV to, like, try to get a break from that. Right. But then we're also cutting to, like, this control room in hell or wherever it's supposed to be where there's different characters coming in and out. And an intern who's starting, like, you know what? I, I don't want to say rip up because I haven't seen it in a long time. But I just always... I'm willing to admit what a hack Joss Whedon is, but Cabin in the Woods, is it just me or is it strangely similar? Dude, my girlfriend turns to me and goes, this is Cabin in the Woods. Yeah. I'm like, oh my fucking God. It kind of is. It really is. <laughs> it's Cabin in the Woods. And people praise that movie for being so original. I don't, I, whatever, I, I hate Joss Whedon. So I, I'm, I, I, I might be biased in that I, regard, but. I, I, I look at Joss Whedon like Judd Apatel. You guys did a, you guys nailed it. And then you beat it into the ground. Mm. And not only that, everyone fucking copied you. And you basically, you almost didn't say don't. I, it's not your responsibility to yeah. do that. But like, ugh. Yeah, I agree. Um, but yeah, the Nables, Pam Dauber, and John Ritter. Uh, I didn't realize she was Mindy on Mork and Mindy. Yeah. I did not know that. that. That's, uh, I guess, where she became a star on. But yeah, John Ritter plays um, Roy, who's kind of like a couch potato. He's addicted to television. I love that there's a TV in pretty much every room in the house. Yeah. Did your family have more than... No. Uh, well, I mean, eventually we had like one in the basement, one in okay. the living room. And I guess my parents... I never had a TV in my bedroom. Wow. Ever. Until, so, until I moved out. We should point out that you and I... Uh, not grew up, but we, there was a period of time where we, our families lived across the street from each other. We didn't know. Which we didn't know. But our childhood homes were pretty much cookie cutter like oh yeah the same layout mm-hmm. so we didn't have to tell you a bathroom where there'd be room for a television no. but we had a little one in the kitchen a little uh analog it had its own built-in antenna oh you know one of those did pop up at some point mm-hmm. they were always great yeah i yeah, used yeah, to yeah. watch seinfeld because it would get on like yes. saturday morning like jackie chan adventures it was great mm-hmm. anyway yeah they he's addicted to tv much to the dismay of pam dauber's character helen because I guess their marriage is kind of falling apart because he's just not paying attention. He's got pages from the TV guide stuck to the TV, like highlighted. He's just set. Well, and she's very successful in her work, and he's kind of struggling selling plumbing supplies, which yeah. is a great montage of those two. That's what I'm saying. Like, this movie had, it started yeah, off Ritter plays really like strong. The henpecked husband so well. And just the guy trying to fucking yeah. sell, you know, a wrench, and, you know, he's dragging shit upstairs. And stuff. It's, it's well done. So they get in kind of like a big fight early on in the movie, which is over his addiction to television. Um, and she smashes the TV. She throws a trophy at the television, which is, there is a great where he just like he has the bathroom TV just on top of it. He yeah. He's just moved on. Uh, but enter uh, Jeffrey Jones, who plays a mysterious man who shows up at the door named Spike, Johnny Spike. And yeah, we were talking about him a little bit before we started rolling but like always a reliable character actor in these parts one of the best yeah i honestly like you know forget about his personal life for a second uh like kind of perfect in every role he's ever been in Mm -hmm. he's really he was a good actor yeah i was going through some of the movies uh you know ferris bueller perfect in that dude i cannot tell you the first time i saw that movie one you love it because you're like wow i wish i could be like ferris every time ed rooney was on the screen like honestly, I, I was like, "Can Ed Rooney come back?" A fucking character. Just, you guess, as as an adult, you're kind of rooting for Ed Rooney. He's too funny. He's just too. There's funny. There's that shot where movie. he's running down the hallway and he stops to walk past the door, yeah. and then he starts running again. Yeah. It's just such a simple, uh-huh. effective joke. And him and what's her name? Edie McClurg. Edie McClurg. Yeah. Him. Those two together yeah, are Grace. like it's gold. It's so much fun. Man, they should have had something and, together. And um, obviously, we're fans of Ed Wood, which he's in. Mm-hmm. Um, he's also in. Uh, a movie that I think we should come back to at a certain point, Easy Money, the Dangerfield movie. Sure. He's in that. He's in a movie that I used to always watch growing up called um, Out on a Limb. Do you remember this movie? It's like Matthew Broderick and uh, a very, very young John C. Riley, 1992. And like Broderick plays like a businessman who gets like, it's very strange. I should actually, we might should revisit this. But right. Jeffrey Jones plays twin brothers and one of them is evil. Hmm. It's crazy. Hmm. 
Uh, who's, Har- who's Harry Crumb? He, oh, yeah. He's great in. And one of my favorite performances of him is in Without a Clue. He plays Lestrade, the uh, Sherlock Holmes is you know police inspector, the one where Michael Caine plays a fake Sherlock Holmes. Great, but. Yeah. And obviously, you know, I bring it up any chance I get is he's Merrick on Deadwood. That's right. And he plays an amazing character where he's one of those guys where y- y- you want to make fun of him, <laughs> but he's endearing. So you just end up becoming a buddy of him. You know what I mean? But we're going to talk about, uh, by the way, I'm looking at his filmography now, like in, in fall. And there's so many movies I forgot he's in. The Devil's Advocate, um, The Pest, which is a movie we've always talked about doing on the show. Um, Ravenous. Have you ever seen that? It's no. Like cannibals I heard the, it's good. It's, it's, it's out there. Uh, Sleepy Hollow, he's in. Um, How High, he's in. Yeah, he plays he vice president. He is in that. It's just so many. Who's your caddy? Who's your caddy? He plays a character named Cummings. Aha, uh-huh, it's so funny. That's pretty good. Yeah, because I was looking at the um, the IMDb trivia, which is so reliable for Mom and Dad Save the World, mm. and it said actor uh, Jeffrey Jones and actor Tony Cox also appeared in Who's Your Caddy. I'm like, what is Who's Your Caddy? <laughs> I remember when that came out. Um, but yeah, he's. we're going to talk about Mom and Dad Save the World on our Patreon show, which to me, it's so bizarre that in that movie he plays the like suburban dad. It was not like him and Lovitz should have had reversed the roles because Jeffrey Jones usually always played like kind of the villain, not I, quite I, like... I know what you mean. But like in this, he's like, you're supposed to be the lovable suburban dad. I don't know. It's a weird... You're, you're so used to seeing him play the asshole. I, I know what you mean. I, I actually, I, I think he works well in that, but I don't know. We'll, yeah. we'll get into that. Yeah. So he's um, offers a new satellite dish trial uh, with 666 channels. Ho, get it? Ho, ho. We're going to keep coming back to these uh, devil. By the way, this movie was originally uh, like working title was Terror Vision. We were talking about seeing boxes in the video store. There's that great poster for the movie terror vision mm. where it's like an eye and like a satellite or something i didn't pick all up on that yeah i mean you've seen this cover or poster or whatever a billion times and it was always one of those movies i see in the video store i'm like wow what a cool poster that movie's probably shit though so i'm not gonna watch it i never did i've never seen it well i guess that would tie more into tunnel vision which this movie is kind of parading i don't know tunnel, vision. T- tunnel vision's kind of like your standard um sketch comedy type of like same thing like different mm. channels and uh gotcha yeah but I wasn't, do, wasn't Kentucky Fried Movie that? Kentucky Fried Movies that? I've never seen that. Yeah, I haven't either. But there's it's like there's a lot of, through channels. I think so. There's so many of those from that time period, though. Um, I think there's even like National Lampoon's Movie Madness, stuff like that. Where, dude, I love the concept. It's just rarely good. There's a. Uh, I actually got into it when I was doing my video on what happened to the National Lampoon series, but it was called National Lampoon's TV the Movie. Which starred like Steve O and oh, Wee yeah, Man. Yeah. And, I remember like, that. I remember oof. that. Yeah, yeah, awful. Someone explains in this control room that Spike they're in where they're watching everything happen that he is some kind of demon. He's not Satan. No. But or, he's someone he's a high up demon, I guess. I guess and they're doing this for Satan's amusement. His amusement. And dude, it's like Eugene Levy's character, he is kinda like I don't know what you would call him, like he just works in this world. He's a, he's. I guess they're all dead because Eugene Levy keeps mentioning his. Yeah, they're dead. all dead. And he is just this. I don't know. He works in this world, but they kick him out. And I guess he mentions like it's like oh it's like at the Geneva Convention. They if they survive longer than twenty four hours, we have to let them go. It's a deal we have, which just seems like a lazy like. Dude, it's incoherent. Yeah. This is what I was talking about. Like so many of these eighties ninety movies are utterly incoherent yeah they make no sense yeah and uh, you know we'll jump back to it i think we're going to talk about barbarian you know me not a fan of the horror genre mm-hmm. although i think it can be the most effective if done right uh lean barbarian no wasted time oh, it's yeah. lean mm-hmm. like it's things make sense one thing leads to the next like it's also a movie i i, I can't tell you the last time this happened i don't know about you but when the end credits roll i was surprised I wasn't. Oh, really? I thought it was r- the right place to end it. I, it. It is, but in hindsight, I just didn't expect that. Yeah. This, it's a smash cut. It's we'll, great. We'll get into that, yeah. but just coherence, man. Yeah. It's really fucking important because it makes sense. I will say one of the... This is this is before the concept got tired, but when he's watching this new TV and there's the ad for Three Men and Rosemary's Baby, I was like, that's kind of funny. Some, but then it's just like after that, they just keep beating that idea into the... So I have to ask you this. Have you ever seen Videodrome? Yes. So, 
anytime they're seeing one of these things on the TV, not mm-hmm. when they're in it, mm-hmm. but when someone's looking at the TV, all I could think about was Videodrome when Brian Oblivion is like, you know, he's giving that address and like the hooded character comes in and murders him. Yeah. Like, it's so creeped out. There is a creep factor. Yeah. Where it's like you think you're just flipping through the channels and it's like three men and a Rosemary's baby. And, you know, the baby pukes all over them. And you're like, you can, and the characters do that at first, too. Yeah. Like, Ritter's, he's like, what the fuck is this? He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, they said we'd get stuff you normally Dude, don't there's get. That, there's that one, it's like the hidden camera show, that's, sadistic hidden video. So that's what I'm saying. There's some that nail it. Yeah. He's watching sadistic. <laughs> he's just sitting there watching it. It's great. Sadistic hidden video. And it's a, it's a canon camera. Yeah. But the cop goes up, knocks on the door. Mrs. Cecily Barth. Yeah. Your husband's name was Stephen Barth. Was. What do you mean, was? Did your husband drive a 1978 Chevrolet Impella? What are you saying? Has something happened to my Stephen? Tell me. Now watch her reaction to the bad news. I'm afraid so. <laughs> I think it's time for Mrs. Barth to be let in on the fun. Don't you? Mrs. Barth, look across the street at that van behind me. Look really carefully. Is that a... It's a camera, yes. Wait a minute. You mean... Uh... Yes, Mrs. Barth. You're on... Statistic hidden videos? The bit is sold because the woman then easily forgives. The f- she's just glad she's on television. It's it's. They commit to it in that way. This movie had... It was so ripe for <laughs> a real satirical. And kids respond to that. Because kids have bullshit meters. And when you're... Like, you can, they can handle a satire... Especially on fucking TV. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I so a lot of friends in my generation who don't necessarily listen to our podcast, they know we do it, and they'll say, like, oh, what are you doing next time? And I'm like, oh, stay tuned. They're like, is that the movie where there's, like, a game show with Satan? And I'm, so so many kids in our generation know of this movie. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it missed me. It just did for some reason. But, yeah, I'm being a little... I think I'm going to be harsh on it because I didn't grow up with it. If I had grown up with this, I you know, th- this would have been, like, nothing but trouble for me. Where maybe we're... It, it's... I it's, love. It's, I love the darkness of it, but it's just because I'm I'm coming in, seeing these parts with the kids that just dragged out for me. Like, yeah, I don't think it's very good. Okay, as a whole, yeah, it's got its moments, and like I said, the cast really carries it. They, yeah, they, they 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 really commit to it, and it's they're fun. But you're right when you say like almost cult classic because it opens at number six. It does not, you know, it doesn't make a lot of money. It kind of flops a little bit, and then it just gets a second life on cable later on. But still, it's not. That, you know, there is a Blu-ray out and stuff like that, but it's not like it's super well-known. If they had more of that sadistic... I agree. ...hidden camera, it, it's a bona fide... I agree. ...almost cult classic. Like, 100%. Like, it's why, like, The Dark Backward was so good, because it was so uncompromising. Yeah. Unrepentant and, like, that, Just, that yeah. cynicism and, yeah. And it's like, well, you're making a PG movie here. I get, I get it. But yeah. at the same time, it's like, man, some of them... There was one, I think it was towards the end, like, over the closing credits, they're, like, showing different shows. Yeah. And one was just unmarried with children i'm like okay like what's the what's the joke so there? yeah they're just not married like it's like, come on dude it's like you didn't can even I, you didn't even try can i talk about one that i also think is is like you said a little dark is different strokes that was the that might be my favorite i audibly <laughs> it's, just two, it's just two people having strokes two but. old men having a stroke <laughs> i audibly laughed out loud i was like that's fucking good i've lost the feeling in my heart all of a sudden i can't see anything <laughs> Sunday's at eight. Different strokes. But like stupid are things like Meet the Mansons or like kind of like a Leave it to Beaver thing. It's like murder, murder she likes. Like there's just a lot of stuff where it's like so, you, you didn't have to go there. It's just it's too easy. Yeah. It's not it's not there's no humor there. Um so yeah, basically the thing is is that they're trying to get more souls by arranging for these TV addicts to be killed the most gruesome ways possible on television for Satan's enjoyment. Um, but yeah, they're, they're sucked into this world and they must survive 24 hours. And if they survive 24 hours, they're let go. But if not, their souls get, you know, and there's this idiotic, like counter 
like yeah. point counter. Again, it's kind of like Cabin in the Woods where they have that type of thing. It really is. And I'll say this. Everything shot in that control room looks awesome. Oh, I, I love I love the uh, control room stuff because it's – you have, yeah, Johnny Spikes there, Jeffrey Jones. You also have Eugene Levy who plays Crowley who's kind of just like the analyst in there. And then there's uh, the intern. So you mentioned this and I'm watching the movie and I'm like, this black guy uh, plays Pierce. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, this black guy. I'm like, is this Michael Beach? And I'm thinking it's Michael Beach from a One False Move, but like mm, Pluto. Yeah. Because I'm like, right off the bat, I'm like, this guy's good. I'm yeah. like, I know this guy from somewhere. And then it, it hit me because his hair is different. Well, I know him bald. You never watched Dexter, did you? No. The first two seasons, I mean, a fan favorite character. Surprise, motherfucker. You've probably oh, right. seen it. Mean. He's, he's the sergeant. He plays Dokes. Yeah. Who is the... Miami PD, Metro PD and Dexter, mm-hmm. they're the dumbest cops on the planet. Right. He's the only cop oh, that's, that's like, this Dexter guy's fucking weird. I don't like him. He's shit talking Dexter the whole time. He's like, you're fucked up. You're a weird guy. Like, he's so aw- Eric King's awesome, dude. He's great. He doesn't get a ton to do in this. Um, no, but he has a, a great line where, so I guess he he's interning for Satan and he's uh, from USC and he mentions he did his thesis on Kurosawa. How do you say it? Kurosawa. Kurosawa and Spike Lee. Is yeah. it? So funny. Yeah. I love that line. Film student. Oh. In hell, of course. Uh, but he kind of takes Crowley's place because uh, Spike's fed up with Crowley and sends him also into this world, into the TV, for no reason. I guess he just hates him. Can I say something real quick, too? Mm-hmm. It's like a weird thing. When you're a kid, weird things stick with you. And I think one of the reasons I think people like this movie is Jeffrey Jones Jones does this thing where the whole thing in this movie, which incoherent, Mm -hmm. is if you have a remote control, you can kind of travel around. He has that one that shoots out of his sleeve, spins, and then he grabs it. That's kind of cool. I think I yeah. think a lot of people like that as a kid. They're yeah, like, people, that's fucking cool. Again, he just does it in such a way where it's, he's so sinister and so... Fuck, Jeffrey Jones. I know. We don't even... Uh, hold on, like, Let me put it... Dude, if he didn't... If his personal life didn't kind of ruin him, mm-hmm. he'd be getting Lifetime Achievement Awards at the Oscars. He would. Uh, yeah, easily the one of the most reliable character actors of the 80s and 90s. Dude, he might be like top three. Yeah. I was thinking about this too, and he, for me it was like... Of this era, top three male character actors, it might be him, Robert Prosky, uh, from Mrs. Doubtfire and Thief, and you know Robert I'm Prosky. I'm sure I do. I'm sure and, I do. And um, Dabney Coleman. Dabney Coleman? I love that. I love Dabney Coleman. Come on. He, not, he's not in a ton oh. of stuff. Yes, he is. He's not a Jeffrey Jones. Jeffrey Jones was in everything, dude. And he had range. You don't think he does. Like you said, it's like with the Mom and Dad Save the World, he normally would play that villain, that emperor character. He, the guy can do other things. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's... He'd be, dude, he, he'd be a legend. Yeah. He will be forgotten. He will be. I, I don't know. What are you going to do? Who's your guy does I'm, not have many fans? I'm not going to say I feel bad for him necessarily. No. But pff, it's turn of fate, I guess. I don't know. So, yeah, they get sucked into the television or the satellite dish sucks them in. and Because the, Ritter agrees to sign yes, the contract. It's, it's a free trial. And I do love the TV's fucking gigantic. It's got giant speak. It's like when you would see those TVs advertised, or it's like in the 90s, you know, a big TV was, it took up a room. It was like. Well, I think he says it in the movie, it's 44 inches. <laughs> That's the screen. Oh, my God. Uh, so, yeah. Those are like $30 now. They get sucked in, and their first channel they're in is called You Can't Win. Which You is get... Can't Win! I now, liked I know um, Don Pardo, is he the host or just the announcer? I believe that's the host. Okay. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, too. I don't think that's what Don Pardo looks like. I don't either. Maybe he was just Maybe the announcer. Maybe it's like they're either dubbing his voice or he's just the announcer. For but... those of you that don't know, I don't think he still does it. But for years, he was the announcer on SNL. Don Pardo, he's dead. So, oh, he, d- he died? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, don't think I would he, hope. He might not still be doing it, though. Uh, I think right now, uh, Daryl Hammond took it over. Poor Daryl Hammond. Deserved so much more. Yeah. Deserved so much more. That was the consolation prize for him, uh, you know, for them booting him off. The, they, for, they, the, for another innocent man, Al Baldwin. <laughs> who, dude, I read they're going to finish that fucking movie. I read too, yeah. He's like, do you have a soul? <laughs> I mean, I want, I, I, it's humorous to me in a sense. A woman just, still died. I just watched him at something and he was so goddamn good. He's, oh, it would be perfect for the show. Miami Blues? We have to do that. Yeah. That, that was a good. I've never great. seen it, and it keeps getting recommended to me lately. I read I read the book a little while ago, so I finally decided to check it out. Who's the author? Charles Wil- Williford. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah he's got like kind of a series involving that detective character, but yeah. Uh, the great Fred Ward. But yeah, he oh, he's such a piece of shit in Hit Baldwin. Yeah. yeah. True to form. I, I, dude, I love the guy as an actor. I cannot say I don't. So, yeah, they're in You Can't Win, which is basically like a game show that they're pitted against each other to figure out. I, they're getting more, like, the question, what's the first question? It's like... Who's having an affair or Yeah, it's, it's stuff like that. They're or all just form, trying to... Former lover or some bullshit. And we yeah. should mention that at a certain point, we see the Sidon Bombs. Is that their name? Yes. They get... They're in like a Godzilla type movie, and yeah. Mrs. Seidenbaum gets crushed. Right, and Mr. Seidenbaum, Murray, is just living in this world happily. Yeah, he's he's glad. He's it's Which like purgatory. I would, kind I would of. have loved more of that. Yeah, because when they get to Seidenbaum, it's in like a it's almost like a Sam Spade was Sam Spade Maltese Falcon. Yes, so that's what it is. Mm-hmm. They're like in a Maltese Falcon world, and it's like Seidenbaum's club. And they go in, and it's like, Mary Saddam's club. And it's like, hey, he's running the club. Yeah. It's a, it looks cool. It's like, Ritter I'm looks good you. as the Sam Again, Spade. Again, I am, I am with you in that they commit to the theming. But then they never fucking do anything with them. Stylistically, they commit to the theming. Yes. But content-wise, they don't really go anywhere. I couldn't get over that driving over Miss Daisy thing. I'm like, why is it on a billboard? I thought that was funny. Why does he keep looking at I it? I will say this about this movie, though. They're sucked into the TV within like it's like 15 minutes. It's mm-hmm. pretty early on. It does hit the ground and move pretty fast. Credits roll at like an hour and 23. It gets to it, yeah, pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, they survive the game show, and they get sucked into the next world. They get sucked into this wrestling tournament, which, again, circling back to things we've talked about in the friend, past, friend of the show, uh, Lou Albano, who's not. The, the Lou Albano I expected he would be. It's nothing to do. He's like reserved. He's just an announcer. Just, just a ring announcer. I wanted to see him. He should have been the guy they're fighting. I don't get it. Yeah. What a waste. Of Lou Albano. Of Lou Albano. You know what, too? This... If you do drugs, you're going oh, to go to hell. <laughs> I, d- I don't know if you saw it, but like, you know, there's been some redubs of this Chris Pratt, Mario, with his voice. I'm like, I should do it with uh, Lou Albano from Wise Guys. I'll put it in oh, the... That would, be, that would be fucking hilarious. You should do that. And you know what? I'm, I'm going to say this as an Italian person, right? Oh, boy. As you and I, um, you can't make a movie where the whole time Mario's, it's a me. It it would get so grating. You can't make a full animated feature film. Oh, are you saying people were bitching about that? They're bitching that it's Chris Pratt. And I look, I got to be honest with you. Hmm. You know where I stand on this. Yeah, you don't care. Not even remotely. Yeah. No, I'm telling you that. But what are they saying? They want it. It's a me, a Bowser. Why are you going to do this? They want it. Like, they were like, that's they, not- Yeah, Charles Martinet should have been Mario in the movie. And if you... Annoying. Yes, we, just, we yes. talked about uh, when we did our... By the way, I mean, this ties into this. The screenwriters, uh, Jim Genoine and Thomas Parker, did an uncredited revision on the Super Mario Brothers movie. Oh. So, again, tying it in. Uh, we talked about the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, which was the cartoon that had Lou Albano in the book ad segments. But Mario in that talked just like a Brooklyn guy. Like, he was hey, like, hey, Paisanos, I'm Super Mario. Right. Like, Hoskins did that. Yeah, it's kind of what you the, have. The pantheon of Mario performances. <laughs> Love Hoskins. He's the best. Um, anyway, but yeah, yeah. No, no, you're right. To do that idiotic, oh, mama mia. It just wouldn't work. It would be grating. It's, like, it's annoying. Yeah. He doesn't even do it in the game. No, he just, whoa, whoa. Ah, yeah. 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 Oh, it's no. reaction shots. That's it. It's all. I heard an interview once uh, with Tom Hanks where he talked about when you do voiceover work, you have a day where you're just going, ooh, ah, ee, ooh. That's mm-hmm. the whole day. You're just mm-hmm. doing like mm-hmm. the in-between sounds that they would need, which got to be fun. I'd love to be a voice actor. Yeah. My God, anyone listening, I can hit that register if you want. So yeah, Lou Albano has nothing to do in this movie. It's fun to see him pop up again. I was excited to see him and then... Nothing. I was yeah. like, God damn it. Nothing. That's what this movie do- did to me the whole fucking time. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, cool. And then, bleh. But, you know. Yeah. So, again, Spike sends Crowley, uh, and I think he says, like, field work. Yeah. He sends him into the field, and he ends up meeting them in the next segment, which, which is had an overexposure. Which had a really funny, uh, like, opening narration. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, a New York lawyer goes to Alaska to freeze to death. Like, I. Again, like you're saying, that twisted stuff that's fun when they play it up. It's funny as shit. And as a kid, it's not like it's super edgy. Mm -hmm. Like you're really, like you're making like Schindler's List jokes or something. Like these are, no, you'd freeze to death. A nine-year-old can handle that. So in in the meantime, by the way, this is when the kids come home from their friends' houses where they were spending the night and realize the parents aren't there and start to put the pieces together. The little boy is more 
inquisitive about it because he knows it's the satellite dish. Then his bike gets sucked in and he knows his dad on TV. Stupid, stupid way for the kid to figure I, things I, out. I have to say this too because I grew up in it. And I, I'm, I'm really getting annoyed with all the nostalgia for the 90s. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, the clothing. Yeah. It's just so ugly, like that baggy BMX shit. bikes and oh, skateboards my... and it's just shorts. It, it, it was not a play. I don't know. <laughs> Look, it, you, didn't, was, you didn't have a good childhood, did you? I had an amazing childhood. I know, you're like, ugh, the 90s, they suck. It was just, well, I just was, I came out a cynic. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, but like this idea, you? like, cynical? Everything was better. So, as the kids are watching this new television where they start to put the pieces together, we cut to um, a scene which I've always seen parodied, and I don't know what the origin is. It's the stereo, with the guys listening to the stereo. It's the Maxwell ad. What was that for? Uh, it was literally, uh, it was probably like mostly in... You never saw that image of the... I have. That's what I'm asking you. What is it from? Where is the... Their ad. For what, though? Uh, it was Maxwell Sound. Like tapes, oh, CDs. Okay. Uh, our sound is so because good, it'll blow you away. I remember the first time I saw it parodied was in one of the Jackass movies where they used the engine and Ryan Dunn sitting in front of it. But I was like... Brilliant. I, that I was when Jackass it. was brilliant. When they would do shit like that. Yeah. But like, yeah that was a great bit in that yeah. movie. But uh, yeah, that was, it was... So in the, It's been parodied endlessly. I know. So in the original commercial, what is it? A guy just sitting there and... The music is hitting them, and he's okay. Because that's again here, his head just blows off. Right, eh. Max Hell is that what it said instead of Maxwell? Oh God, <laughs> hardy har. No, the, like the, Silencer of the Lambs. Dude, that shit really took me out of the movie, man. I'm just like, you guys have all these resources, and you're doing this. Yeah, come on, take another pass at the fucking joke. So, um, this is another thing. At a certain point, I think it's the kid comes home. Or he gets something out. There's a box of Dunkin' Donuts at some point, uh, prominently uh, framed in the center. And I was thinking, like, wait a minute. Running scared. Billy Crystal's character, when he comes in and Gregory Hines is in bed with the woman, he has a box of Dunkin' Donuts. Like, what is what the Dunkin' Donuts product placement in the Peter Hines films? I, they, they had a relationship, He, he like Don Kalfa, uh, you know, James Sicking, and uh, Dunkin' Donuts. By the way, the Dunkin' Donuts of like the '90s seems so much better. It's it was so funny watching this the other day because leading up to this, I swear to God, out of nowhere, I was like, "I need to go get some donuts from Dunkin' Donuts," <laughs> and I talked myself out of it because they're just not they're not like they no. Get, no. And you know, what? I love the old commercials with like that fat guy with the mustache. Time to make the donuts. Oh, there's the one where uh, Hervé Villachev comes in. I goes, "The plain, the plain, the chocolate, the chocolate." It's <laughs> It's awful, but it's like the shit is just. It's so like. I remember when they retired that guy, like people, and then people were like sad. I'm sure he was. A, those it was like commercials the fucking were, Maytag man. You yeah, know, it's like around people, forever, dude. I took it down. It sucks. Now they're just called Duncan. They just call them now. So the next world they end up in is the Northern Overexposure. That's where they encounter Crowley, who kind of decides to aid them at this point because he's also in the same boat. Which I'm not sure how. What, what, what his purpose is in these worlds. He can't die because he keeps saying he's already dead. Incoherence. Yeah. Uh, Hate it. And that's, I don't know, they're trapped in the shed that's surrounded by wolves. They're trying to, like, fight their way out. There's a fire starting. Again, I, I will give them credit in that they tried to make these segments different in a way. Oh, yeah. Um, they did. And th- this is, like, I feel like this is where they get separated because... Because yeah, she goes, because Crowley was digging a hole to another conduit, oh, as they call it. They end up in the cartoon next. Yeah. Which they're not separated. But yeah. that's, the, I thought that, again, commit the theming. It's like that Roger Rabbit opening. It's, and, and not only that, the jokes within that segment are great. They're, they're, they feel like they would be in the Looney Tunes stuff. The humor is similar. Yeah. And yes. I, I fit, read fit, fit the motif. I read that that began production before the movie did. Like they were working on that thing for like 6 months before the movie oh, began. Bro, <coughs> um but this is where the kid who's watching at home realizes that it's mom and dad in the TV because and again that's Ritter Ritter even in his voice is so good. He's like, you know, for a lady mouse you're pretty attractive. Yeah, I like that. It, it's just it, it's he really is for me was the best part of the movie. Mm-hmm. And as it starts to be it's not clear, but they get separated after this cartoon. He pulls down. Oh, a door. right. She goes into the mouse hole or yeah. whatever, and then the cat patches it up. Um, and then we, we're kind of just cutting through Ritter's character, Ron, going through all these worlds. And every time it happens, I'm just going, "Man, I would so much rather be watching a movie where Ritter's a private eye, and like, <laughs> I'd rather be watching a movie where he's in the Western world. Like, he's so funny, and just like uh, that type of physical comedy." 
which for me, I never recognized him for. It wasn't until we did the Problem Child movies that we talked about him a lot. I was like, he was a damn funny physical comic. Absolutely. And not forced. He was no. great interacting with the world and mm-hmm. props around him. And again, uh, Saturday Night Dead with Dwayne's Underworld. It's like whatever. I don't know. It's almost there. Like yeah, you got him, he's he's tied up. He's got Sphincter Boy written on him. Like it's all. They keep almost instead there. excellent. They keep saying excrement. Like, like, shit like that. It's I like, know. <coughs> it's so. But it's so like it's so weird because school, they really commit to the theming. Like it looks like Wayne's basement. Like they do, they do the extreme close up cam, it's, and it's yeah, and then they put like a fucking fire poker on it. Like now that I remember, I that that has to stick out for every kid. Because if, if, if you're kind of my age, you grew up with Wayne's World, mm-hmm. so you already know that. Yeah. And then, like, something about a hot poker in your face, and it looks like... Because, like, I mean, Wayne's World at this time in 92 was, what, super popular, probably. Well, they were going... They they were asked to do a cameo. Oh, were they? They were filming Wayne's the second World. second one. No, yeah. I think the oh, first, first one. one. Okay. So, I could be wrong about well, that. Well, but that's that's what I'm saying. That, like, Wayne's World was huge at the time, oh, yeah, so... yeah, very popular. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, this, this is where the movie, for me, it's like, when he gets to that private eye world... And he's talking in his inner monologue, which is fun, where he's just like, oh, I've seen movies like this before. Again, Ritter's just so goddamn fun. He is good. And it's, the movie looks good in that black and white. Like, it's, this is where you tell, like, Dude, Peter Hyams is a good oh, yeah, yeah. DP. Oh, yeah. I'm like, Silent Bomb's Club. I'm like, this looks great. I'm like, can we, can I watch more of this? Like you said, it's, it's. I would have so much rather if the whole movie was just about him in this noir world, mm-hmm. because it's, again, the theming is great. And the only thing that feels out of place is Ritter, because he is out of place. Right. And it's just, I don't know, he was so great. That, but um, then seidelbaum has got a, a remote of his own that he gets I, shot. Oh, and man. It's... Yeah. And then, because, again, she's, like, essentially out of the movie, Pam Dalbert. I don't know what the deal is. I don't know if they were just trying to film around the pregnancy, but, like, she always ends up, like, in distress or, like, she's kidnapped. And it's, she really, it's, like, out of the movie uh, for this, like, the latter half of it, which mm. is weird. Um, but this is the part two where it's like, you have to have this fucking nineties shit with the kids hacking into the dish. And, and we've, they kind of set it up earlier where the kids like appearing on all the TVs in the house. Yeah, it's like a whiz. So I get that. Like they do put those seeds in early, but like, man, we were so obsessed with hacking into shit in the nineties. Especially if you were a kid with glasses, it was just like, that's oh, what yeah. you did. Yeah. Um, so this is when like, I don't know the, the last part 20 minutes of this movie are for me pretty damn fungus are so quick it gets rapid yeah once it starts real like yeah it's there's like a um kind of like a man with no name western where i do like when spike starts to enter these worlds he changes Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. he's like you know the classic mustache twirling villain has tied hell into the railroad tracks and roy has to save her but then he takes him out of that world so they're hopping from world to world to world it's kind of like when family guy used to do those like they did a thing where brian and stewie go from like show to show to show it's and this is where you finally get the what this concept is yes what, what like inspired this movie like uh-huh. i wish they kept this more because what do we get the next generation <coughs> yeah which was all right it's pretty funny when jeffrey see, jones is all of them He's he looks like Data. Like I know there, it's, yeah, he yeah. really does. And his I feel like his wharf was pretty good. His wharf was good. Gosh, he keeps looking at him, and all the like you said, all the characters are Jeffrey Jones. And I, Ritter's got the bald cap on, looking like Patrick Stewart. I don't know. It's fun. Uh, the Crash Dummy is another good one where he's just in this car as a Crash Dummy. Man, I don't know. You have to be early nineties. Those things. I they think, just missed me, but I know I of them. I think they gave him a show. They had a show, a toy line. The, yeah. Dude, those toys, I cannot tell you how obsessed I was. No, because they were like plush dolls, but you, they, their limbs were detachable. Mm-hmm. Dude, I thought that was the great. Well, there was also like cars you could wind up and smash into a wall, and they would like explode into. What was that from? Was that an ad? Crash dummies, yeah. For I what? think that's how it originally started, for automobile safety. No, I think it was for something. I could be wrong. What would be the point of advertising crash test dummies? I could think of a few, whatever. But uh, does he go to Three's Company after that? Uh, He goes to the hockey one. Yeah, that was kind of stupid. But again, it's quick, though. It's just very quick. Yeah, it's quick. The remote becomes the hockey puck. Then it's the driving over Miss Daisy, which you hated. It was just, uh, just the, uh, just put the title on the screen. You need a billboard. Uh, Then it's that quick Three's Company joke, which Which is, is quick. It's they and don't it's, overstay it's, it's welcome. It's good. Look to the camera, screams, he realizes where he's at. 
Um, then there's like the medieval fencing world, which again, there's so it's so one after another that you really don't mind how quick it's going. Um, now this is the same studio Warner Brothers that did nothing but trouble. So this is the we're, we're coming to the absolute grinding to a halt where we're seeing in the movie, right? There had to be some studio, because uh, Nothing But Trouble is 91. This is 92. There had to be some Warner Brothers exec that's like coked out of his mind. Like, we need a break for a music video. Where are the kids like? Let's get a hip hop group in here. And I, I think you're right. Uh, we get a, I think this song predates the movie, right? This song's awful. Uh, Salt and Pepper. What was it? Start me up. You gotta start me up. Start me up. Yeah. Over. Over and over and over. And I will say this, though. It is kind of fun to watch Ritter and Jeffrey Jones. It's a little bit to watch. Is he supposed to be like Prince? I don't know what the fuck he's doing. It's Prince. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, he's got the beard and the hair up. And but then just the way the dancers... Are, oh, it's terrible. It goes on way too long. Tossing the remote around. Oh, it's like, awful. What the fuck is this? It's, it's awful. I hate that shit in movies where it's just like, no, you'll, you'll accept this because it's on the screen. Right. It was the 90s thing. We love to throw in that... <sighs> Um, but it feels endless. I don't know. Jeffrey Jones is the DJ, and yeah. like, I don't know. There's yeah, there's that... a couple funny, but it gets it gets like you you start to feel embarrassed when you're watching <laughs> it. I felt embarrassed. I was just like, oh all man, all around the world. That the wasn't embarrassing. Song. That was funny. And yeah, then then Ackroyd returned the fair by being in the music video. So right. it's, um, so again, the, the movie wraps up in a very strange fashion. Where he eventually, he finally ends up back at this western theme movie that they're in. Uh, the train's coming at them, and Spike has deactivated their channel-changing ability, which you would think, why didn't he just do that from the start? And the kid is, like, telepathically, like, screaming at the TV, like, Dad, just turn it off. Turn, hit, and he points the remote at the train and clicks power, and it blows up. <laughs> <laughs> which is again it's yeah. like where, where are the worlds like what are the rules I, in this I, universe I, I don't. they don't make no sense no um and then spike ends up trapped in the medieval themed world with the rottweiler who's the neighbor's dog gets sucked into the satellite dish and he's trapped and by the way crowley is losing limbs and it, it, we i, I didn't want to i purposely skipped over the whole french revolution one because it's just so it's kind of the last one almost. it's the best big one yeah off, and, off of it's, head. Uh, uh, it's just so it goes on way too long and again ritter is so funny he's in, they're, they're cross-dressing because he's the marquee they're trying to escape and he's masquerading as a woman one thing you could say about john ritter even in problem child which from all accounts like everyone filming that knew it was going to be a, a hunk of shit he gave it his all and great movies great movie yeah. well, no but i'm saying You've, you heard that episode of Gilbert's podcast where at the end he came up to Gilbert's like, you know, you take these roles oh, and you yeah. hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. And then they end up saying <laughs> yeah. in the fucking Oscars in memoriam for John Ritter, they show a clip from Problem Child where he's like getting hit in the face by yeah. a sledgehammer or something. It's just he he fully commits to it and he's having fun. And by the end of it, the, the kid comes back into the narration where he's like, so mom and dad worked everything out and dad opened up a fencing school. And he has a line where he's just like, you know, don't watch too much TV. And the movie ends. Yeah. And not only that, it ends with like, he's just kind of like in some dumb pose. And like it a... freeze frames. <laughs> yeah. It's like we don't see him and the mom, like everything back to normal, him, like the family together. It just, it just like kind of ends. And I'm like, all right, they had to cut some things out and trim it because it's a really weird beat to end on. What else do you say? I don't know. I would sort of like the scene, like maybe, I don't know, they're at home and... He's like, yeah, you know, there's a big game on tonight, but I'm going to spend some time with the family. Quality stuff there, Joseph. Yeah. Just, just tie it in. I want that bow. I want it. I get you. Everything. Yeah, the fencing school was just, not a good bow. It, and By the way, what happens to Spike? Spike is trapped in the medieval world with the Rottweiler. Oh, okay. By the way, the 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 program is still running. By the end of the, they don't shut down the the, the six six six. Yeah, Dokes takes it over. Yeah, it's still a thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So more couples are going to go through this. There's no... I, I guess. Yeah. Um, that was the other thing, too, is that the whole dumb thing is Ritter gets out, right. but Pam Dauber didn't because she didn't sign the contract. So it's only... he It only messy. applies to him. Yeah. If she's in the world. Oh, well, we don't have a contract with her. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Um, and look, I'm not asking you to be hyper tight with your story, but it's got to make sense. It's got to make sense. And this just doesn't. 
at all. And I know it's a movie where they're being sucked into a demonic TV, but come on. There's something to be said that when I say I would have enjoyed this far more as a kid because you overlook those gaps in logic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is something... And being introduced to this movie as an adult, there were just so, too much of that you know, stuff I would have forgiven as a kid oh, that's, yeah. that I couldn't forgive as an adult. Uh-uh. Um, even though I think the performances are all really fun. Dude, it's so close to being good. Yeah. It's, it is the, it is an almost cool classic. It is. This is one of the closest we've got. It is. Because it's... if it was good and it bombed, it's in. Mm-hmm. People could be like, dude, State Tunes fucking awesome. We got to watch. It's, it's like, like all the reception has been mixed, excluding a select few kids that had uh, most of our audience has grown, you know, grew up watching this on cable. And I think it's baby's first dark comedy a little bit. Do you know what I, I mean? See that. I think yeah. that's why people like me were like, you know, they'd see this. It's like you feel like you're seeing something edgy mm-hmm. when you're seven. Sure. And you're like, oh, of course, when you see like hot poker you know, in the face, an like, old woman getting run over by a car. Like, right. Yeah. It's, that's what I'm saying. As a kid, I can see why people like this movie. I would have enjoyed it far more had I seen it as a kid. That's all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I am. I understand why it was recommended and why people want to hear us talk about it because oh, for sure. there's a lot to unpack. Uh-huh. Like you said, it is dark. It doesn't quite pack. There is. Okay, I know, I'm busting your balls. Uh, you're right, though. You yeah, are totally right. It's I can see why it was recommended, and I I have no regrets about watching it and checking it out. No. I, I think there's merits here. I again, those when it gets real quick and they're just cutting from channel to channel, it's fun. It's Ritter's having fun. The Ritter and Jeffrey Jones characters interacting and fighting in all these worlds are really. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I wish it got to that point a lot quicker, mm-hmm. but. You know, what What can you say about, it's only like barely an hour and 20 minutes long. and It I, doesn't really it's, overstay it's, its welcome. It doesn't overstay its welcome. And it is a, like you said, it's, I'll at least be thinking about this movie. It's one of those weird movies where it's, the fact that it it didn't do what you want, mm-hmm. it sticks with you. Yeah. Because you think, not, you don't, not necessarily thinking about how I would have done it differently. Sure. But it's a, oh, what if they would have went a little further there with that? Or what if the, it's. Ah. Evidently, um, AMC, the network, uh bought the rights to it and is planning to do something with it like a new series or something the, so the premise is there yeah it's you know it, it gets it just gets it gives you such a good opportunity to be creative with, mm. with the different sure you know styles and absolutely stuff. especially in the 90s when like cable was such a big part of everyone's lives mm-hmm. like now it's like you know streaming but cable was like you could go from the weather to a cartoon to a medieval movie to a noir film it was just like changing that channel would always mm-hmm. especially when you there was no guide or like you just kind of had to take it right leap to leap and mm-hmm. find something to watch so in that regard um i think there is a lot of fun beats here right? like you said i wish it went a little bit further but um i'm glad to, you know we finally got to see it because now it can stop being recommended <laughs> yeah. Um, enjoy yeah um so on our Patreon show at patreon.com slash almost cult classics, we're going to talk about... Which is currently losing subscribers at a rapid clip. <laughs> Thanks, Adam Rifkin. Um, we're going to talk about what Ryan evidently tells me is our second most requested movie, which is Mom and Dad Save the World. So to those of you that support us over there for $5 a month, uh, we hope to see you over there for our discussion on that movie. And to those of you that don't, um, maybe you'll consider supporting us. And then we're going to do um, a little holiday movie next. And I was looking online like, what are you know, Christmas movies that don't get that much attention. And one came up, The Ref. Oh, okay. And right now, um, I, I guarantee we're going to stop recording. Ryan's going to go home, look at the director, and go, oh, dude, there's a lot of films i got to watch here. More than likely. I don't think there's that much to talk about, but either way, we're going to talk about The Ref and whatever else ties into that. And uh, oh, wait a second. The Ref? I do. There is something. I know who directed that, I'm pretty sure. Ted Demi. Yeah, I, we, we have stuff to talk about there. Uh, guess what? Salt and Peppa Push It music video director. Push It was my ringtone for about a decade. <laughs> Love Push It. Uh, yeah, so we're going to come back for our next uh, episode 26, talk about that. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>